Vikings from Scandinavia crossed the sea to raid undefended monasteries in Ireland, Scotland and England in the late 8th and early 9th centuries, returning home with their booty. But by the middle of the 9th century, they'd begun to stay in England over winter. And in 865 AD, they assembled a great army capable of conquest. They were intent on establishing a permanent presence in England. They chose York as their base, capturing the town in 866. For the Vikings, York was an unusual and successful experiment in urban living. As well as houses and workshops, the town had rudimentary sanitation in the form of very basic outside loos. And I know for a fact there's one infamous artefact in the Jorvik Viking Centre that preserves a lot of detail about everyday life here a thousand years ago. Oh, this is fantastic. All these wonderful finds from the Coppergate excavations and such arrangement. Look at those shoes over there. Fantastic. We're getting very close to the lives of individual people. But I want to get even closer to one individual and one specific moment in their life. And this is a really famous find. Christine, <laughs> hello, hello, hello. hello. Nice to meet you. So this is, um, this is a find. Do people gravitate towards this oh, find? Oh, they do indeed. They do indeed. Particularly the children, I have to say. Do they? So let's just take out the case. I can kind of excuse myself, um, perhaps an unhealthy fascination with this, because I did used to be a medical doctor. I can take it out, yes, can I, Christine? Can. And I lift this out. Very carefully. Now, this is an extremely important and beautiful object. This is a Viking poo. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, first of all, it's amazing that it's a Viking poo and it survived in all its glory. Most of the faecal matter at Coppergate was all kind of mixed together in cesspits. But this poo, this rose from the ashes or rose from the sludge of Coppergate, completely pristine after a thousand years. And it's quite important because it means we can have a look at it and we can tell something about the parasites that Vikings had living in their guts, the intestinal worms. There are at least two varieties of parasitic worms in here. And we can also tell something about the diet. Very high fibre diet. You can kind of get that from the size of it as well. I mean, that is an eye-wateringly large poo, isn't it? In 1995, a crack appeared above ground, revealing a mine shaft 12 metres deep. So it was up there at the top. As Malcolm began excavating, he found a vast treasure trove, untouched for nearly 2,000 years. So what were you doing up there, Malcolm? I was just clearing out the corner and there's a line of little green coins. Oh, wow. At first, I thought there were sixpences. Picked up one of the coins, and then, of course, the archaeologist's nightmare, bloke who picks up an artifact like that, goes and rubs all the evidence off. <laughs> when I turned it over, I could see that there was a laurel wreath round the head, <gasps> and instantly I knew it was Roman. So how many coins were there in total? Uh, 564. Yeah. Dating from, I think, it's 317 to 343 AD. The reason these coins were here is a mystery. Perhaps they were hastily hidden and then forgotten. They're beautiful coins. You can read his name, Constantine. And on the other side, yes, look at that lovely she-wolf and Romulus and Remus suckling underneath it, so the, the myth of the, of the origin of Rome. Yeah. yeah. Stuff down a mine in Cheshire. That's amazing. The coins were a sign that the Romans had been here and triggered a search for more evidence. At the bottom of the shaft, the cave has unearthed a Roman tunnel. This is There's lots of, lots of uh, pick marks on yeah. here. Yeah, and the really telling thing is the way they, they swung down, like, in, in that direction there. Yeah. So. so they're making their way in this way. That's right. And, and really, hacking at yeah. the walls like that as they come yeah. through. It's likely that these tunnels were dug by Roman slaves to reach copper ore deposits. Copper was exported all over the empire. Copper alloy was used for coins, cooking pots, horse trappings, jewellery, statues and building projects. But there's something even more exotic than these particular mines. Wow! 
When copper ore comes into contact with water in limestone caves, a very special mineral is produced. A waterfall of azurite blue. I've been in quite a lot of caves and I've never seen anything quite as stunning as that. These wonderful copper minerals just leaching out of the rock and then being washed down and redeposited by that little waterfall. And what beautiful, beautiful colours. So I think the ancients would have been interested in the colour to begin with. It would have been the first thing they noticed, even before they knew about how to get that copper out of the rock. The Roman name for this was cerulean, or deep blue, and they used this mineral pigment to dye clothing, glaze pottery, and paint their homes. Gorgeous. I'm in Winchester trying to understand how England was still being moulded into a Norman kingdom in the 100 years after 1066. A groundbreaking discovery has shown that it was the Normans who laid the foundations to that most British of institutions, our National Health Service. The clues come from human remains found by Dr Simon Roffey and his team during an archaeological excavation on the outskirts of Norman Winchester. This is one of how many skeletons then, Simon? This is one of um, 115 that were excavated from the site. And what is the site then? Well, the site is a, a, a leprosy hospital, found, we believe, in the late 11th century um, as a, a community, really, to to cope with the, the sudden spread of leprosy um, in Western Europe at, at that time. Anybody who knows me knows that bones are my thing. And these ones show very obvious signs of leprosy, an epidemic spread from the Middle East in the 11th century. That face is pretty horrific, isn't it, looking yeah, at that? No, yeah, no, it is. It's, it's, this is one of our most visual examples of, of leprosy and, and the effects it would have on the, on the individual. It's quite a horrendously defiguring disease, mm. isn't it? Yeah, but they yeah. were in a place where they were looked after. You know, their spiritual, their physical needs were, were, were taken care of. As we lay out the rest of the skeleton, there's something curious about one of the legs. We've got the top of the fibula and the bottom of it is completely missing. Mm. What we think's happened here is, is that the foot has been surgically removed, it's been amp amputated. Yeah. Probably because of the state of it in life and it needed to be taken off. There's very little evidence for medical care or medicines. Hospitals mm. were mm. essentially a place to be cared for. But in this example, this individual, we believe, has had their foot amputated and also, importantly, it's healed. So they've been treated after the uh, surgical removal. Yeah. Do we know of any hospitals in Britain before this period? There's no archaeological evidence for uh, hospitals in, in England prior to the Norman Conquest. So this is the earliest excavated hospital in the country. It's the earliest excavated leprosy hospital in Western Europe. And it was leprosy that, that really kicked it all off then? This was the disease that, that meant that hospitals were founded? Well, there's an argument that could be made that the sudden rise and increase of leprosy really did act as a catalyst to the foundation of hospitals. Of course, later on, they become more general hospitals. So there is a, a social responsibility, I think, that is part of the Norman Conquest. So it isn't just all you know, big macho, macho castle building. There is, a, there is an element of compassion there as well and care for yeah. what's going on with perhaps those that are, that are suffering in society. 